Hello, I am Zachary Omar, one of the management associates for Czech Group at UKC. And here today we will be interviewing Professor Dato Dr. Shamsul, who is a professor of social anthropology. And um, so the first question I have for you is, we heard there's a national unity blueprint. Could you explain more about yeah. it? Thank you very much. Uh, I think in, uh, in 2013, in September, uh, the Prime Minister uh, declared that there will be a National Unity Consultative Council modeled on uh, what was created after May 13, 1969. The whole aim of that uh, NUCC, we call it, uh, is to rethink about national unity in the country because we have been uh, talking about national unity since 1969 and 70 yes. and 44, 45 years on we still haven't got that the unity so I think the whole project was to not only look at whether we have unity or not should we redefine what unity is because uh, uh, it stretched so long that we never realized that we haven't uh, actually uh, effectively created one so the Department of National Unity and National Integration was given a task together with the Institute of Ethnic Studies UKM mm -hmm. to become the Secretariat. Our task, uh, the Institute of Ethnic Studies, was to uh, conceptualize where do we move from here and did all the research that would uh, enable us to come to some uh, ideas of what uh, people generally need and then the public through various methods, through um, dialogue, open dialogue, town, town hall style all over the country and then looking at the media, what the media has said in the last couple of years about unity mm. and reports from uh, NGOs that submitted what they think of unity and special interest group and then we have also uh, our own research from the Institute and also from JP9. So the source of the report making is quite uh, extensive. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that conceptual paper, which is chapter one, yes. uh, constitute? Uh, number one is we argue that for 45 years, we have not achieved unity. What did we achieve? What actually uh, we have succeeded in doing? Because for that 45 years, Malaysia has been seen by countries around the world, including friends from uh, Islamic countries, from Africa, even presidents of the United States, as different as Bush and, and Obama, seem to claim that Malaysia has something to offer as a model for development, a model moderate Muslim country, mm -hmm. and so on. So, we realize that we do not have a term, nor a terminology, or a, a explanation what we actually achieved. So this is where we came up with the term social cohesion. So we may not have unity yet, but we have achieved for the last 45 years some form of cohesiveness. Yes. And this cohesiveness has seen as to be very positive to a lot of people. But then again, uh, it, uh, this cohesiveness is, uh, is, doesn't mean it's a complete unity. There must be something that is left not yet agreed upon uh, on issues of language and issue of Bumiputra policy mm. and on the other side there are all the positive ones uh, cultural borrowing and you know accommodation everyone celebrating Hari Raya together uh, we call it uh, you know Diparaya and so on uh, yeah. so so we decided that the way, the best way to, to, to approach is to redefine the notion of unity and introduce the new concept. And that because we feel that the slogan that has informed us is unity in diversity, not unity in uniformity, because we can't get that uniformity. Yeah. I mean, even Germany during Hitler's time trying to create unity in the most bizarre way was not, you know, did not come out into anything. Yeah. Uh, it caused a lot of misery and lives lost. So I think what Malaysia has done uh, was uh, interesting because uh, how do we manage historically the diversity we have, which is created through colonialism and so on. Right. In Indonesia, 
I'm taking the closest example we have. They also have this term called uh, unity in diversity, Beneka Tunggal Ika. Mm -hmm. Malaysia also have minority, uh, unity in, uh, in diversity. But Indonesia's way of solving unity, uh, diversity, to create a unity is through assimilation principle, which means that everyone has to change their name, have to accept that there's only Bahasa Indonesia, there's only Indonesian name, just the way in Thailand too, only Thai language. Whether you are Muslim or Buddhist, you have to have Thai name. But Malaysia decided that that's not the way because demographically, Malaya at the time was 50 uh, Bumi Putra and 50 non Bumi Putra. Mm -hmm. So there's no way you can ask the other 50 to change everything to be accepted into the, the other 50. It's impossible. Right. So what happened was, there was a certain amount of agreement to this fact that we are not going to be uh, using the principle of assimilation. So we accepted the principle of integration. Integration means we accept. So in 1950, in 1949, there is a community slice committee, CLC, formed by the British. Yes. Where the elites of all the ethnic groups met together and decided and expressed. And these are available in, in the Kew Garden archive in London. Uh, if you want to have an opportunity to look at, which I have and some of my students have. How inside this community, the elites, they present the Malay, Datu On, and they present the Chinese, uh, Tan Cheng Lok, and presenting the Indian, express their opinion about what they like about each other, what they don't like about each other, and what they want. So really, it was during the British time in 1949, this idea of integration uh, was very important. Right. We have to accept our differences. Right. So from then on, we move on. And one of the symbolic, symbolic acceptance of their differences, agree to be different, is the vernacular school system. Right. Within which, a Chinese school, private, non-private, Malay school, private, non-private, Indian, Tamil school. So, it gives uh, Malaysia at that time, or Malay at that time, uh, a symbol of integration. So, do you think this should be maintained, the vernacular schools? Well, I think there is this, uh, this is what I call legacy schools. They are not schools for the sake of school. In a rational way, we decided to have them. Right. It was a negotiator. This is where Malaysia is famous for it, bargaining and negotiation. Right. Through a negotiation, they, I think the, the best solution they had was the Razak report in 1956 to say that this is the best way we conduct our education system. You retain what you have. You want a private school, go ahead. But the government will only promote the national school and pay for the national school. Yeah. But those who, who, uses, uh, those who use a Malay language uh, and adopt the national uh, curriculum will be given funds. So there were negotiations about funding, not only about education system, but also about funding. And the openness that it allows, for example, international schools and all this to be made. So I think this is... Uh, this is the first attempt at sprinkler system, I call it, in Malaysia, right. where everyone find a way of uh, trying to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. So, could you explain more about the societal smoke detector and the societal water sprinkler? Well, you see, uh, I have been involved in solving, uh, or rather in negotiation, uh, relating to uh, ethnic problem in Malaysia. The last one was on the book called Interlock. Interlock is a novel written by Abdullah yes. uh, for school. Uh, the average version was used in school for Form 5 students, only in three states, Selangor, Negusmilan, and Wilaya. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the states don't use the book. Yeah. But because urban Kuala Lumpur is the center of critique in the country, so you could imagine all the clever people there trying to find jobs and finding how to actually uh, engage you know, in a more productive way and start. So, there was a big issue. It became a big issue. There, there was burning of the books and brick fields and so on. So the government created a, a special commission or special committee and I was asked to be the chairman of the committee. And you can see that the Indian one side and the Malays and the Chinese. So how do you deal with this, mm. about this book? And there were three or four words on paraya, which is, you know, uh, in English, paraya is now adopted as a word to express how uh, useless a particular group is, you know, <laughs> or how downtrodden a particular group is. Right. But in Malaysia, it means something else. So a lot of the untouchable people who feel this is, you know, reviving the caste system and all this stuff. So they were not happy. So we created a lot of these committees, what I call 
fire fighting committees okay. or I call it bomber committees why yeah. when there is fire you create a committee but I prefer to create a sprinkler system because that's also a way to fight the fire even before it starts yeah. so how do we do socially sociologically to do that that means we have to monitor the process of national unity in the country mm. through uh, our method is through the use of uh, high uh, quality of life uh, criteria mm. because a lot of people are unhappy over a lot of things but what are they is it about housing so the quality of life have got 11 elements which housing security uh, education and so on so from there we would be able to know uh, in a more generic sense rather than an ethnic or racial sense what are people generally unhappy about right so, so earlier on we were talking about the national unity blueprint it's, yeah can this help solve the problem and how do we actually actualize this program this cannot solve the problem because integration is always not an easy fit right. uh, so unlike assimilation it's a rule you do this you like it or not you go to the school mm -hmm. but integration is a, a situation where i would describe in two ways number one is a jigsaw that doesn't fit well yeah. so it always moves it's not a watertight sort of you know fitting jigsaw mm -hmm. alternatively i would like to use Rubik cube as an example so it's always moving, we can pull, we can do whichever way we want to do, but we never get the same color. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sprinkler system is more like knowing how people react according to uh, unhappiness they have over what? Over material being, over abstract stuff. So from there we can, we can see, uh, we can create a map of the people in the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the red zone? Where is the orange zone? Where is the green zone? So you immediately have to resolve a problem. So it's not an ethnic problem. It's a quality of life problem, yeah. which we believe that has been articulated in ethnicity form. Right, yes, uh, yes. And so is there such thing as a social contract, ethnic bargaining, Bumi Pucha rights be preserved and non Bumi Pucha rights maintain yeah. their culture? Well, there is a lot of, uh, I think, uh, uh, people defining social contract in their own way because uh, literally social contract we don't have we don't sign any contract yeah, yeah. but what me it means here is if you st believe that malaysia survive on bargaining and negotiation mm -hmm. what comes out of bargaining and negotiation is an agreement mm -hmm. that agreement is a form of binding in the sense of a gentleman's agreement right all right when they agree that okay but that, uh, that some uh, aspect of citizenship will be given to some group of people and in lieu of what special privileges all these are exchange and negotiation which then uh, put into various regulation constitution mm -hmm. or whatever so it's never a clear contract as, as you buy a house yeah it is a more embedded in the whole system how we survive especially we survive in a federalist system mm -hmm. so federalism itself is a form of social contract for me because the, the, the component state has to agree to the central government on what they have to do and what they're not to do. So for example, now, uh, when it comes to income, petroleum, all the money will be taken by federal government. The state government can only have 5%. So they have no choice. They have to agree. Every state has to agree. So these are a ways of looking at Malaysia and the notion of social contract. Right, so um, next question, it would be, what do you mean by R&D in social science and how does this apply to your studies of ethnic and relations? You see, what I'm, I'm trying to do with the Institute of Ethnic Studies are two different things, but interrelated. Number one is what I call academic analysis. Right. We have to do research. Mm -hmm. I mean, our bread and butter in the university is doing research, publication and expanding the knowledge and so on and so forth. And then students, we have PhDs, a master's, a research. And we get research funds to do this. But there is another aspect of university that people don't highlight very much, but in my institute is of utmost importance, which is public advocacy. Right. How do you make the knowledge accessible to the public? Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so we have partners, NGOs, private sector, 
uh, government departments that are interested what we are doing and we continuously uh, discuss with them uh, different issues like for example there was an Allah issue mm -hmm. so we organize round table and we see uh, how people react to it and then one of the things that we discovered that was never mentioned in the whole uh, uh, Allah issue is the fact that uh, Malaysia has now have a lot of internal migration of labor so many Sabahan Sarawakian are working in Kuala Lumpur and they are all Christian, most of them. So they, they have church, they want to go to church, they are religious people. Yeah. And what is the Bible? It's in Malay, mm -hmm. it's not in English. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible, the Insawa and Sabah, are all based on the Kalimantan Bible in Indonesian language. Right. And they have Allah inside them. So, you see, federalism itself creates other issues. Eh? And we never saw that as an issue. We never imagined Sarawakian and Sabahan who comes to work in KL are actually devout Christians. Mm -hmm. And the moment they start talking about Christian, because in Semenanjung you cannot teach and produce uh, publication on Christianity in Malay. Mm -hmm. But in Sabah and Sarawak, it's okay. Yeah, it's so, so I think this issue was never seen in a very clearly historical and factual sense. There was a lot of emotion. Right, right. And it's interesting that it is Lim Guan Eng that raised it. Why? He, Chinese in Sarawak are all Christian. Mm -hmm. So he needs to get those words. So I'm not surprised this is raised in this context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, <coughs> could you argue a bit more in the length on unity and diversity versus yeah. unity and uniformity? Well. I think uh, I just go a little bit on the R&D bit, yeah? Because, oh, yeah, sure, yeah? You see, what happened is the government spent millions and billions of dollars on scientific R&D right. for innovation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in Malaysia, if there is no unity, if there is ethnic violence, all those beautiful things built by the scientists mm -hmm. and the money spent on R&D will be wasted. Yeah. So why don't we spend some money <coughs> for a social R&D, which means to monitor the societal well-being so that the R&D in the sense can continue and the outcome can be beneficial to the people. So that's why I was thinking that uh, to term it is called social R&D to allow people to understand from the scientific R&D to the social R&D, both of which is about innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and regarding the, uh, the position uh, Unity. of unity in diversity. Historically, um, the whole region of Southeast Asia uh, was colonized by so many different European powers, French, German, uh, at some time, and Dutch, and English. So as a result of which, we create this plural society. And there are waves of people coming, not only once, but the first wave, second wave, third wave. <coughs> the challenge is when we get independence, what do we do? We have diversity. Diversity has three traits. Number one is the positive trait. We celebrate diversity. Jalan-jalan, huh? makan-makan, you know, this is what we do all the time. We celebrate warna-warna Malaysia. Yeah. But we also worry about the negative impact of diversity because diversity emphasizes differences. Mm -hmm. People are concerned about being different. Uh, um, uh, why, uh, is halal food? You know, something like that, you know? And we don't, we don't, but we, in, we don't invest very much on solving it. We invest a lot on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, on the positive side. Right. Uh, tourism, Asia, all these are celebrating it. Yes, yes. But inside they are worried. What happens if we cannot resolve these differences? And number three is, it also has a moderate, moderation trait, which means that people will find on their own how to solve this problem, not waiting for a, a top-down solution. Mm -hmm. So I think, the diversity in Malaysia is interesting in the sense that it is being resolved through integration, not through assimilation. Mm -hmm. so, so, as I said, uh, there is continuous differences being developed or, or come to the fore, and sometimes uh, it's hard, sometimes it's difficult, uh, sometimes it affects families. So, the issue now is, I would say, there are three different uh, components of looking at this. Number one, at the individual level. You and I, individual, we have the psychological makeup and how we perceive the world. Mm -hmm. Number two is the collective level where you belong to a community, Bajau or Minangkabau or whatever we belong to. Right. We have our own uh, 
well view of how looking at things. And finally, is the norms and values that have become standard to us. Uh, not through the collective only, but through peer group, you know, and all this stuff. So for me, these three elements has to be uh, used as an analytical tool to actually see what is the state of ethnic relation in the country. And otherwise, uh, we'll be looking and shooting in the dark. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So, um, could you elaborate ma more on top-down versus bottom-up approach to unity? Well, when I talk about top-down and bottom-up, top-down is a conscious effort of the government to, uh, or any authority to, to introduce ways and means how to, be, uh, how to foster unity and so on. Yeah. But I think equally people are not helpless. Mm -hmm. People have got their own innovation and methods and techniques. Yeah. Uh, that allow them to be together. And uh, we have to give credit to these people because they have managed to enjoy this relationship for 40 years. They must have done something, right? They can't just be fighting. Of course, you can hear the voices, but I think the relationship is a lot more uh, positive than we imagine. And I think this is where we are very stingy with the way we praise ourselves because we think praising ourselves uh, is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I think Malaysians have done very well. I'm very mature indeed in dealing with this because they won't sort they won't sort out a violent solution. They will find out what is the most <coughs> uh, amicable solution in, in if they have differences. Right, right. So uh, can you tell us more about the top conflict and they want cohesion attitude and also what is the source of disunity in Malaysia? Well I think uh, as I said, the source of disunity is not so much disunity, the source of differences. And these differences expressing uh, v different viewpoints, it doesn't mean it's disunited. It, that you, it doesn't mean people have become, you know, uh, encouraging disunity. Mm -hmm. You just have different opinions, but you can come back together and converge. Right. So I think this is where I think it's too simplistic to see this as uh, disunity. Um, for me, uh, like in the university, university is about debate. Yes. It does, does it mean that people are disunited? No. People are united, agreeing about debate. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Malaysia, that is the beauty of the country. We we argue, we debate. You see the social media, all the rubbish inside the social media. But what can we do? We have to accept the fact that people are saying what they want to say. So the question now is: there are rules and regulations that trying to make to block and to do all this, which I think in some ways is useful because some are very offensive. Right. Uh, but on the whole. I think the Malaysians are quite uh, mature in the way they deal with this. So, in, in, in that sense, uh, I would say uh, our ability to to rationalize this is a lot higher than uh, a lot of other countries that I know of. Yeah, in in, in say in, in 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 our ASEAN region, for example. Mm -hmm. So, what is your solution to solve Malaysia's unity problem, and what is not resolved, and why? Well, as I said. Because the key to Malaysia's so-called unity, which is we haven't got yet, so it's irrelevant to talk about unity, uh, I think it's because we have to go back to the basic principle or the DNA of our method of solving our, uh, our or solving the solution of differences and solving diversity, which is integration. Integration means just to accept we are all different, but somehow we are living together in the same place. You find a way how to adapt to one another. So in some ways, uh, it's not an either-or situation. You either have unity or you don't have. For me, there's always adjustment. Bargaining negotiation it simply means there's always adjustment between Malaysians. Uh, what they like, what they don't like. And a lot of people also enjoy. See, we, we, we highlight too much the differences. Can we highlight also the ability of Malaysians to share? I think this is also uh, a problem analysis, it's not a problem reality. Uh, for me, a lot of the questions about Malaysia's unity or disunity are analytical issues, analytical problem. They are not the reality problem. The reality situation is very different from this concern that people has in terms of uh, uh, intellectual content and in terms of factual content. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I would say mixed marriage, for example, it plays a huge role in our society. In Sabah and Sarawak, it's the number one uh, factor that creates the integration. Uh, in a family, there's Christian, there's 
uh, people who are uh, believer of indigenous religion and so on. Okay. Yeah, so access to becomes a problem because religion has become an ethnic boundary. Yeah, right. You are Muslim, yeah. oh, all the Malays are constitutional Muslim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not all Muslim are Malays. Yes. And that is also an issue. Yeah. So Indian Muslim, Chinese Muslim, so it becomes an issue among the Muslim. Mm -hmm. So the other problem that I have is analytically is we emphasize too much inter-ethnic. Mm -hmm. We don't look into intra-ethnic. Right. I mean Cantonese and Hokkien, and they are in the, during the Cold War, the Hakkas is different in communism. <laughs> In different from the Cantonese. So it's interesting for me to look at internal differences. But we are so concerned about our major boundaries, we forgot that within ourselves there are differences. And it, of course, among the Malays in the Semenanjung itself, the differences between the Klantanese and the Kedahans and the Negris Milan mm -hmm. is huge in the process of, for example, in the process of uh, uh, choosing partners. Among the kids in the university, I know. They may not talk openly, but I know uh, the worry of the prejudices and the stereotypes that they have among themselves about different ethnic groups within the Malays themselves. So I think we sometimes overdo and are over concern mm -hmm. with uh, the, 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 the macro element yeah, without looking into the micro. So in your hopes for more integration between hard science and social science in terms of providing useful research insights and methodological advancements, do you think it, it is possible and what useful insights can be gained from this? Well, I think in a very practical sense, the scientific area that is now showing interest in ethnicity is mainly genetics and in medical studies. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of studies that are very uh, oriented to different ethnic groups and racial groups and even psychologists have got a uh, discovery on how uh, people of non-white color is less smart or whatever it is. All this, this mambo jumbo is here in London, you know, in psychology of uh, a big discussion on psychology yeah. and the human. Yeah. But for me, I think uh, what we need is a more, a different type of scientific study, which is uh, research in computer science lab that can help us to generate all sorts of possibilities in understanding the mapping of the differences. I'm thinking of having uh, yesterday uh, Dr. Raja was, you know, from Sabah, yeah, was yeah. talking about the ME. We probably need an ME for ethnic relations to be able to map up in the whole country what are the differences and people are unhappy about. Right. And this is what I mean. We have to think advanced. We can't, we can't think and sit back, oh, let's do survey, let's do uh, field research. Important. Mm -hmm. But there are ways how to monitor this huge uh, group of people in the quickest time mm -hmm. to know what's happening. This is where I see uh, the more the computer science science mm -hmm. uh, will be um, relevant and immediately uh, useful for us. Right. Okay, so there you have it, Professor Samsu. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today at Chaku. Thank you very much.